the reproductive system, <clears throat> the system that is, you can live without it, of course, but uh, our species cannot survive without it. So an interesting one. <clears throat> and uh, it's where we diverge in uh, males and females. So, <clears throat> let's begin. Obviously, <clears throat> very interesting. You will die. I will die. We're all going to die. But uh, our genes may live on. And uh, so we are transient. <clears throat> our bodies will decompose. They will end. But uh, with reproduction, <clears throat> our genes that uh, made our bodies may continue on. Right, let's get right to it. So I'm going to do it in two lectures. <clears throat> this first lecture, overview, and then uh, get to, to the male. <clears throat> the male reproductive system um, involves making gametes and um, getting them to females. <clears throat> Female reproductive system requires making gametes and then also having a place to incubate this embryo and this fetus. So it's more complicated. Um, men's reproductive timeline is from puberty to maybe till death, you know, even as you age, you can still make sperm. Um, females goes from puberty to menopause. And so there's just a window there. Um, and then we'll talk about strategy and how different they are um, because of this fact and how much uh, effort and how much, uh, um, um, investment goes into the offspring by male and female, what a big difference that is. All right. So <clears throat> first of all, this uh, frog lays, let's say it lays 10,000 eggs. How many need to survive to continue the species? 999 can die and do die actually on average. Um, well, 998 die because if not, we'd be up to our necks in frogs. Reproduction would be too much. Um, so yeah, it sounds harsh, doesn't it? But uh, in humans, of course, we're very slow uh, reproducers, a litter size of one usually, and we give it so much care. But in this case, this oak tree out here will have, <clears throat> you know, thousands and thousands of acorns all potentially becoming an oak tree. So for today's lecture and then the next lecture, big picture, getting there, all right? Then <clears throat> the male reproductive anatomy and then uh, <clears throat> um, uh, sperm production and the hormones. Then uh, females, again, egg production, <clears throat> getting the sperm and egg together, hormones. Mammary glands, which are, I'm talking about reproduction. We're not gonna do the chapter, it goes into pregnancy and all the placenta and all that. We just we don't have time to do all that, but mammary glands are, um, accessory glands to help with reproduction. And then we'll talk about sex, birth control, and infections real quick. All right. <clears throat> so if you think about it, um, there's, a, there's a book called The Selfish Gene, and a uh, famous one, and it's going to describe how acorns just use ache, oak trees to make more acorns. So maybe your genes are using your body to make more copies of your genes. <clears throat> Scratch that, not maybe, it is, right? So you, you think you're all cool with all your hobbies and sports, everything you do. You are just a vehicle for your genes to make more copies of themselves. They're just trying to get you ready to, um, to have more babies, right? So it's one way of thinking things about things, isn't it? What about a reproductive potential? Um, just kind of Google, you know, what's the most <clears throat> um, kids, you know, a human can have. And you, you come up with this uh, person that lived in the 1700s, you know, and again, I don't know, trust it completely, but 69 kids, wow. Very fertile, a lot of triplets and twins, right? And our litter size in humans is one, normally one. <clears throat> and uh, twins are rare. And uh, triplets, quadruplets are really rare. And some of you have some twins, but if I looked at what well, percentage, you'd be a tiny percentage. Um, and you know, this idea of octomom or whatever, having sextuplets, that's, that's uh, 
in the days of in vitro fertilization and hormones. But, but normally, even there's nomadic times, we believe when you had twins, they would even kill or smother one of them because uh, to be a nomad, you, can't, you can only carry one. You can't carry two. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, small litter size we have in all kinds of parental care. Oh, what about the male side? So women, yeah, and again, <clears throat> I don't know if that how accurate that is, but uh, um, indeed, you can really see uh, the difference in strategies between male and female. Male, <clears throat> males, we make uh, 300 million sperm a day, right? And so sperm are cheap and easy. And so our strategy really is to, uh, have as many babies as possible, impregnate as many females as possible. And that's the male strategy in evolution. Females <clears throat> in this and a lot of most animals are the choosier sex because they have a limited window and then they have an egg to fertilize and then they're pregnant in our case for nine months and then a breastfeeding and you know, so there's a huge investment by the female. And so she tends to pick a male that's gonna have better genes for her offspring. Whereas males, you know, uh, unless not, if time isn't limited, you know, they want to uh, have as uh, many babies as possible. Where females, because of that investment, tend to be choosier. You guys aren't being anthropomorphic here at all. I'm just being biological. <clears throat> so yes, <clears throat> reproduction, that system, you can live without it. But your species can't, right? And, uh, uh, and then you look at these worms, these earthworms, uh, the animal world would call them hermaphrodites <clears throat> from Hermes and Aphrodites, Greek. Um, and uh, they mate with any other individual. <clears throat> so <clears throat> two earthworms come together and they exchange sperm with each other and they both have ovaries and testes. And so uh, everyone's a, a mating partner. They come up in the lawn and they glom together. They give the sperm and then uh, they'll fertilize their eggs that way. So we have two sexes and um, yeah, it, could, it could be three. We'll see why, you know, what the purpose of, uh, of having different sexes is because it's kind of, you see kind of a pain in the butt when it comes to reproducing, but um, Asexual is having kids without sex. You just have a clone of yourself and uh, very common in the plant world and in insects. And uh, you'll see even uh, some fish and uh, some lizards, they could do this um, where they have uh, this miracle birth, right? They just have kids without having sex, without any, just by themselves. And um, the issue with it is that when you make asexual reproduction, they're clones, they're identical. But sexual reproduction, what we do, humans, is that we have uh, our diploid cells turning to haploid gametes, sperm and eggs. <clears throat> and then we mix um, with the opposite sex and they come together to make this diploid organism from these two haploid sperm and eggs. And it's unique. Each sperm and egg is unique. And it allows us to shuffle those genes and get unique kids that they're all different. In terms of asexual, you can see this uh, sea anemone is going to butt off. You can see a little easier here, this hydra. Asexually, it's easy. You just make a copy of yourself. You got a spider play, take a cutting. It's asexual reproduction. These aspen trees, and even here in Maine, you can see, <clears throat> in this case, they've all turned color once. So we, we know that this is one clone. That over hundreds of years, these trees have just gone underground and made new copies of themselves. So it works very well, this asexual. What's the, what's the, what's the deal? And even these lizards, they uh, discover these lizards on these, these islands and uh, female, another female, another female. They never found a male. There are no males. This is an all female, several of these species of lizard. And they all lay eggs and um, they don't have to be fertilized by a male. And it's interesting here, they have the behavior, they kind of switch off. They, they do this mating. We see this mating here, but there's nothing being transferred. They're just acting and they do this it helps with ovulation and then and uh yeah and so why aren't all creatures asexual why why do we need to do this well we'll see that lizards like this we think that that species <clears throat> does not last very long in evolutionary time and <clears throat> they tend to be dead ends they go extinct ah uh, you guys read that 
I hate to be the one to spill the beans here, but men, we use up resources, we don't have any babies, you know, right? Um, <clears throat> think about, you know, from a female's perspective, you want to have some offspring, right? You, you can't even have your gene, you're all genes. You have to share half your genes with somebody else. Like, come here. Yeah. So you dilute your own, you know, your own genes and your next with your offspring because you have to bring in this male. So for the female that's having the young, it's always diluting its genes. It's not as dangerous to find a mate and it uses resources and uh, the males can't have kids. They just, they just give this little bit of sperm. That's all. And so um, definitely um, <clears throat> you can see that the females are carrying the, the heavy lifting here in terms of reproduction. And let me show you this. This is what's amazing that sexual reproduction occurs at all. It's called this handicap of sexual reproduction. Because imagine, you know, you have a female that can have two offspring. And so with sexual reproduction, you always have these males that are useless. They can't have any babies on their own, right? Asexually, if everyone can have young, look at that. So there is a huge handicap to sexual reproduction is that we're always half the half of the population, you know, can't have offspring. So it's just putting a drag on our reproductive capacity, like how much, and evolution is about how many babies you can have. So with sexual reproduction, it, you're cutting it way, way down. So why? Why is it so prevalent, sexual reproduction? Mm -hmm. Well, evolution, one word answer, right? And from Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen says, uh, takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So what we have is uh, species that are adapted to their environment, but the environment's always changing. Talk about climate change, but new diseases and pathogens and predators and all kinds of things that your environment's always changing. So if you can't evolve and adapt, you're gonna go extinct. So those lizards that are all female, they may be doing fine currently, but it's something, a new disease comes, there's no variation no variation. And that's, you guys know from evolution, it's so important to have this variation in order to be able to evolve. Indeed. So that's why we think um, this handicap of sex is, uh, is kept along because we're not all clones, therefore we can adapt. And those are the species that win an evolutionary race. All right, so reproductive cycles and patterns. So a lot of it, most animals, you think about your dog, your cat, uh, baboons, uh, you think about uh, deer, they go into a period of heat, estrus, estrus cycle. Um, a lot of farmyard animals, a lot of animals do this. And so um, humans have a, a menstrual cycle and, and we hide our, our, our receptivity, you know? Um, you know, the dog's in heat or a deer uh, gives off pheromones and, and, and just, attracts all the males to mate, right? Females, it's hidden. Uh, it's hidden. Um, ovulation is subtle. Like you can take your temperature and figure out what you're ovulating, but otherwise it's, there's no outward signs of it, which is weird in the, in the, for most mammals, for sure. And it's usually, uh, our reproduction is cued to the seasons in most animals, not in humans, uh, but uh, right now frogs and salamanders are out there. They've got uh, some frogs, they're reproducing now. So they can lay those eggs, the tadpoles, they have all uh, early summer to develop so they can get out of there before the ponds dry up. Deer, they're going to mate in the fall because they want the, they know how long pregnancy is and they want the fawns to be born just in peak time in early spring so that they have enough time to grow and it's not too early and it's snow on the ground. So yeah, so reproductive patterns, um, uh, humans are thrown off, but you look at most animals and, you know, the birds, have nests at a certain period of time because that's when it's best. So fertilization is the sperm meeting the egg and it's important, it's the same species, although there's ligers and zorses. We're not gonna talk about that, but um, in fertilization, sperm's gotta meet an egg. And so we'll talk about in us how the sperm meets the egg internally, but uh, a lot of animals have external fertilization and uh, such as these frogs where uh, she lays the eggs in the water and then the male is hanging on and just lays the sperm on top of them. The salmon, same thing. Um, there's oh, evolution, it's just fascinating. I don't have to teach enough of it, but uh, in this case, you know, the big males, you know, will be there, the female will lay the eggs and he'll put the sperm on them and he'll be able to chase off the other males. But there's another strategy that, what if a salmon was kind of smallish and looked like a female 
Then the males, because the males will trace off like lesser males, but if you look like a female, they won't chase you off. And they're called sneaky, um, uh, let's see, how would I say this? I'm not gonna say, sneaky maters. And so uh, they come in and they just kind of put their sperm on the eggs and then when the male's not looking. And so, and it's, yeah, it's a strategy. <laughs> they have just as, it can be just as successful as, you know, fighting every guy out there is if you're sneaky and you have the young there too. So anyway, it's another story. But we have internal fertilization and we need it because we don't lay our eggs in a pond and put sperm on them, right? When you have internal, <clears throat> when you have, uh, when we hold our, our, our offspring inside of us, or even if you lay an egg, like a chicken like, can't lay an egg and then put sperm on top of the shell, right? So the chicken has to put the sperm inside the hen so that it can fertilize the egg before the shell is put on. Okay. And lastly, just to think about reproduction is parental care. And us humans, just amazing amount of parental care, right? Yeah, still, as an adult, you go like their parents, they, they pay for dinner, right? You know, you think about college, you guys, and uh, how old you are, you know, that they're still, why are they putting this, this energy and, and resources into you? Well, evolution tells them that they want their genes to be successful. They got to help their kids or their grandkids or their, even their cousins and things. So uh, anyway, um, but parental care is as big in humans and you know, most mammals and birds are big at it. Uh, as opposed to a snapping turtle that she lays the eggs, abandons them, and then they come out and they're on their own, right? Or even a horse, you know, it, it's born, it stands up, you know, it starts running around, right? Think about humans or these little pinky things that uh, can't feed, can't do anything, right? Even when we're one, two year old, we can't even feed ourselves, right? So, yeah. All right, so when you read this chapter, uh, don't focus on meiosis. And I'm, I'm gonna cover quickly how sperm and eggs are made, but, uh, I'm not, we don't have time to talk about metaphase, telophase, all that, but bottom line is you need to know meiosis is what makes sperm and eggs that are haploid. And in this case, we actually make four sperm from one <clears throat> kind of stem cell and we make one big egg. What happens to the other three? Well, they just turn into these polar bodies. They're just destroyed. So we make one big egg and four little sperm. All right, so let's get to the male reproductive anatomy. So um, the internally, I mean, the primary organs of reproduction will be the gonads. And gonads is a general term for ovaries or testes. So that's where uh, males make sperm and hormones. The ovaries make eggs and hormones. And the male hormones are androgens, they're called, testosterone. And then uh, estrogens are made you know, on the female end. So internal organs would be our gonad testes and true. And then external reproductive organs, the penis and uh, scrotum is what uh, holds the testes on the, in the outside. All right, so looking at the male. Um, of course, the, uh, you make male hormones, these androgens like testosterone. Um, and so uh, the um, testes are making these. And they not only influence sperm production, but secondary characteristics, facial hair, muscle mass, all these things. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk a little more about development, how males and females diverge early on. But um, let's see, what are the functions here? So production, nourishment, storage, uh, the gametes, which in male, males are sperm or spermatozoa, another name for sperm. So yes, yeah, so you have to make the sperm, make 300 million a day, all right? And then they need to be uh, temporarily stored until you're ready to use them. And then sex. So we'll see how do we get the sperm. And the sperm are, you know, the sperm are, are actually going to be in this all this liquid. And so the liquid semen is has sperm in it normally. And that's going to help the sperm get in the female reproductive tract and be successful finding their way to the egg. All right, so in terms of sex determination, and uh, basically in normal circumstances, you know, XX is female and XY is male. So it's the Y that's the uh, sex determining chromosome. If you have a Y, you're male. But uh, again, this is, can be quite fluid. When I, when I say it, I'm almost thinking this is, uh, you need to think about the differences between sex and gender and um, there are triple X's, there's an XXY. And so there are some indeterminate forms, uh, 
that can happen too. Some 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 other things too. So I'll put that out there, but I won't have a lot of time to get into that. But generally, we start out the same. Um, I've heard some of you say, can we start out female? I don't know, but you can see we have the structures that you see the differences between men and women, sexual organs really are just variations, uh, like using the same ingredients to get different kinds of cakes. I mean, that was weird. All right, but um, for instance, the, uh, the scrotum, the sac that holds the testes is homologous to the labia majora, the labia on the, on the female. And when you look at the, the clitoris and you look at the, the penis, Oh my God, they're the same thing. One's a lot bigger, um, but it's the same structure, same erectile tissue. They both have these legs that come out. One's much smaller, one's bigger. And then, uh, so we start out with this basic plan and then under the influence of hormones with that Y chromosome is gonna make produce, make produce is going to uh, influence you have, um, you go one direction or the, or the other. So the testes, yes. Um, <clears throat> interesting, the etymology, the name, you know, testicle and testify, I like to testify in court. Uh, I've read a couple of different things, you know, what, what, that, what that's all about. Um, I guess in the old days, only men could uh, testify in court. So they would feel under the robe to see if you had testes, you could testify. I <laughs> oh don't know if that's true. And then others say like, it's, it's the witness to the sex act because the testes are right there, you know, uh, close to the sex act, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, some interesting side notes here, but testicles, uh, we have uh, two of them. Uh, you only need one, uh, but uh, you only need one over 18. Um, and they're in these uh, scrotum. Scrotum is going to be the skin where they, they hang on the outside. Yep, so you have two, actually two, and there's a wall, a septum in between that. Here's the testes, and the scrotum will be the sac, and this will be the testes, and there'll be a septum or wall that separates those two. One's lower than the other. <laughs> Tailors know this. I, I'm forgetting, forgetting which is what which, but um, uh, one is going to be lower than the other, to, so they're not like right next to each other. All kinds of fun facts, huh? So, um, <clears throat> so we have our testes on the outside, hanging out there on these scrotum. It's very vulnerable to say the least, right? Very unusual, it would seem. Um, but some mammals have this, and it turns out that our sperm will only be produced lower than body temperature. If your testes stay up in your body cavity, they're too warm, and uh, you become infertile. You can't produce uh, sperm. Why? I don't know. You know, I've looked into it, but that's just the case. And uh, for us to have these external testes, again, vulnerable, they're hanging out there, you know, it's, uh, it seems very dangerous, but... Uh, other animals like rabbits, they, they descend during mating season, then they're back up in the body. And things like whales and, and elephants and others, they don't have external testes. So they can produce sperm in their body temperature. So again, interesting question why we need to have our testes out in the scrotum and why we have to have sperm develop at a slightly lower temperature. So the testes actually develop uh, by the kidneys. Those kidneys. And it's called the urogenital ridge, so urinary genital, yeah, so they're from similar tissues. So the testes and the ovaries develop high up in the body cavity, and the ovaries descend and stop down in the pelvic area. The testes keep going all the way to the outside. <clears throat> and so um, I have another slide as well, but we're going to see this, this ligament here. It's called the gubernaculum. I just like the sound of that, gubernaculum. It's very, I don't know why. But that's this little ligament that's gonna help kind of guide the testes. It's gonna come down and then it's gonna go through an opening in your abdominal cavity to get to the outside. And that shows, you can see it here. You can see the testes descending. And uh, so this is, it's, it's gonna be your parad um, peritoneal cavity. Like we had pleural cavities up here. Peritoneal cavity is gonna be where our abdominal organs are, right? And so a piece of that actually comes forward, this, uh, tunic, uh, this va vaginal process comes down and it makes kind of a space around in the testes down there. And then the testes, they have to kind of violent, not violently, but they need to get from the abdominal cavity to the outside. So they go through this inguinal canal and this canal allows the testes to go through. And in some men, it stays open. And so 
that's why um, think about hernias. There's different kinds of hernias, but men get these inguinal hernias way more than females because we have this weakening because our testes had to go through an opening. And so that opening, all of a sudden later in life, if you're really straining, a piece of intestine can go through that opening and get trapped in there. And so um, hernia surgery, they also put a piece of mesh there to keep that opening uh, closed. Now, sometimes the testes don't descend and you can see 99% of the time they do in full-term birth. But sometimes they don't, and especially premature, because you see they, they descend late in, in, uh, in gestation. And it's called crypt orchism. So crypt means hidden. Another name for testes is orchid. And if you guys ever work with orchids, they've kind of like got a ball at the bottom. And so they kind of looked to someone like they were testes. And so crypt orchism means hidden orchids or hidden testes. And um, when a male child is born, they will see that the testes have descended. And if they haven't, they'll go get them. I mean, they wait a little bit to see if they descend on their own, if not, because if you leave them up, if they don't descend, um, you'll be infertile. Um, so they need to get those, get those down. Again, more risk of testicular cancer as well. All right, so that spermatogenesis, again, is making sperm, genesis, creation. So sperm creation, it can't be at our 98.6 Fahrenheit. It's got to be a little bit uh, uh, lower than that. So um, what happens is we have these testes out and hanging out there in these scrotums. So two to three degrees below. Cool. And so when we look at this, this whole thing, this is a cut open. I'll have another, another drawing here, you see. But we call this whole thing here the spermatic cord. And it's going to have in it your vas deferens, it carries the sperm. It's going to have a lot of blood vessels, nerves, muscle, and connective tissue. There's this cord. And the vas deferens is within it. It's going to carry the um, sperm, sorry about that, all the way up from the um, uh, testes, all the way up into the body. Here, I'll stop that messages. All right, and then a bunch of arteries and veins, and the arteries and veins are parallel like this, you can see. And so they're gonna actually exchange heat, this counter current exchange. Now we did counter current exchange in the kidneys, right? So in this case, you have hot blood coming down the arteries and then cooler blood coming up the veins, they will exchange heat. So it keeps the testes cooler than the body temperature. It's pretty cool. The muscle is called the cremaster muscle that is in the spermatic cord and the cremaster muscle will raise and lower the testes. So in the cold, the testes rise up and then the heat, they come back down again. There's even a cremasteric reflex if you stroke the inner thigh that causes the cremaster muscle, the testes to rise a little bit. And then in the scrotum itself, there's muscle. That's why it kind of, it will crinkle up called the dartos muscle kind of muscle going every direction inside the scrotum for kind of crinkling. So the testes can come up to the body or descend when in warmer temperature. All right, looking at the testes, we're gonna see it has a really tough white coating on it here called the tunica albuginia, like albino white, tunic is a coat. So testes, whenever you look at a fresh testes, I got this white tough coating on it. Yeah, and then we'll see in the testes is in, in these different kind of like segments, like an orange, and you've got all these seminiferous tubules. These are these tubes that make the, seam, the sperm. And all of them are gonna come in this little area here where a bunch of little tubes come into this epididymis. This epididymis is this long tube where the sperm are gonna mature. And then they make their way up. It's called the ductus deferens, or some people call it the vas deferens, like a vasectomy. So vas or ductus deferens is the tube that's going to carry the, um, the sperm upward. And if you feel in, uh, in any guy, you feel in the, um, where the testes come up and then the spermatic cord, you'll feel the vas deferens is solid. Like it feels like plastic, it's solid. The rest of it is blood vessels and muscles is squishy, but there's a, uh, I'll show you the vas deferens. It's a solid too. Here's another view. So you can see the testes and we're gonna see, these are all the tubes just meters and meters of tubes. The reedy testes is where all the tubes come together and they're gonna to come into this epididymis. 
And the epididymis is going to come up here. They're going to go this long tube where they mature before they'll go up there to fast efforts. So yeah, when you look at fresh testes, they've got this white coating on them. It's really tough. Lots of collagen fibers. And that's that tunica albuginea, the white coat on the outside. And then you look inside, you just see tubes, tubes, tubes. The seminiferous tubules everywhere, making all that sperm. And they are in little, uh, the tunic albuginea kind of separates it into different like uh, um, segments, you know, the capsule comes in to make these segments with 250 lobes, huh? Yeah, and this kind of shows the lobes. In each lobe, the tube is like, yeah, 70 centimeters long, wow. Like three quarters of a meter long is this tube. And it's tiny and coiled up. And so you add it up, you can see you've got yeah, three to nine over like 10 football fields long worth of uh, tubes to make sperm. Yeah, and then we're gonna see besides these seminiferous tubules, there's gonna be little cells in the nooks and cranny that are gonna make the, uh, the hormones. These will be the interstitial or Leydig cells. I'll get back to them. So, yep, one long tube, one long coiled tube. And that's where on the outside would be the stem cells and the sperm are made towards the center. That muscles will push those sperm all towards that epididymis every day, making all new sperm. Yeah, so you look in that, uh, so this is a spermatic cord. And uh, the cells on the outside, you're going to have these uh, stem cells. And they're always making new sperm. They're dividing and making new sperm. And then we'll see there's gonna be cells, kind of uh, bigger cells in between. And they have an important function of nourishing and cleaning up garbage and, and taking care of the sperm as they're maturing. So these are these sustentacular cells, kind of support cells that'll be in there. And the outside there's gonna be uh, muscles. Draw them red. Yeah, so the smooth muscle will contract and that's what's gonna move the sperm along, the contraction of these muscles along this tube. <clears throat> yeah, and as you get older, sperm production goes down, you know, everything, the tube gets more solid. And, yeah. So here's a beautiful view. Slice through the testes and you can see all these seminiferous tubules, all these cells that you see are gonna be various stages of division to make sperm. And now here's these interstitial cells, see here? Yeah, so these are the ones making the testosterone outside of the tubes. So the sustentacular cells, we just call them Sertoli cells. They're gonna be these big cells here. Uh, that's the ones I can see that are gonna be the support ones. And so they're big cells and they will, like I say, do the cleanup and, and, and feed them and like do all that because the other cells are dividing like crazy, making new sperm going through meiosis, right? You should know too that there's a, a blood testes barrier, just like there was a blood brain barrier. And that prevents um, some of the noxious things from getting into the sperm and, and causing uh, issues like drugs and things like that and toxins. And it also it prevents um, your antibodies from attacking these new sperm that have this unique protein code and they're all, you shuffle the genes, and so it keeps the immune systems from attacking your sperm. So spermatogenesis happens from puberty on. So little boys don't have, are not making sperm until they hit puberty, and then spermatogenesis ramps up and it goes on the rest of the life. It probably slows down at a very old age, but it continues on. And so on the periphery of this tube, you're going to have these uh, um, um, cells are going to be the uh, spermatogonium or the um, um, primary uh, sp sperm cells. They're going to be um, dividing. And as they divide, they come up and they'll make these things called spermatids. And then finally, the mature cell is called a sperm. But you can see they move from the outside up towards the lumen or the center of that tube as these cells divide. About 70 days, it looks like, from stem cells to the sperm. Yeah, and we talk about, you know, women have the pill contraceptive, right? What about the men's pill? And they're working on it. They have versions of it, but 
all kinds of interesting issues. I, I'll save it for a different lecture, but just because of this time frame, you would have to get on male birth control, you know, a couple months before uh, it would be uh, useful, right? Because you already have sperm developing, it takes that long. <clears throat> now the sperm don't actually swim at this stage. They, they actually, they're not swimming, they're just carried along by muscles. And even the epididymis where they mature, they can move, they don't move too much. They, they really only swimming once they hit the other fluids in the semen and they start swimming. Here's a cool close-up view. And you can see, you know, you can look in your book, it goes through more detail, but you can see here's these primary cells you're gonna divide and make these spermatids. And then uh, eventually they'll turn into sperm that have these little narrow heads and these long tails. So they lose a lot of the stuff and they become a sperm. Here's a sperm. So it is a uh, haploid cell and it's got up here, it's got the DNA. Here's your DNA. Um, it's gonna have, uh, interestingly, it's gonna have an X or a Y uh, chromosome, right? Either an X or a Y, not both. And so uh, you can actually, during in vivo, you can pick male and female sperm because which sperm is gonna weigh more if you were to centrifuge it, the male or female sperm? The ones with the Y chromosome, the male are gonna be lighter because the Y chromosome is small and the X chromosome is big. So theoretically, you could spin a bunch of sperm down and the lighter ones to the top would be the ones with the Y chromosome, more likely male and female. Yeah, anyway, that's in theory, they, I think they do that. Yeah, so here's this headpiece, and then here's got lots of enzymes, and it's gonna, have, it's gonna be the mother load, it's gonna be holding the, um, the DNA, and you're gonna have this kind of mid piece with lots of mitochondria, so it can swim and the tail is gonna swim. Pretty slender, not a lot of fat on this though, right? So you're gonna see, in the semen's gonna be sugars and things to power it. You can't like load this thing up with uh, carrying a lot of energy. <clears throat> yeah, so there's the sperm. Um, Indeed, it is a uh, very unique cell with a long flagella. We have a single flagella in our sperm. And uh, again, lots of mitochondria here to power this, power this tail to swim. And then the head, yeah, it's gonna have, uh, it's gonna hit the egg and it's gonna cause a change in the egg so that it allows it to enter the egg and other ones cannot enter it, yeah. All right, and so these uh, interstitial cells uh, in the nooks and crannies, as I mentioned before, produce the testosterone. And early on, even as a fetus. So you're making some testosterone that, that drives the uh, development of penis and testes and everything like that. Yep, another view, yep. So these are the sperm producing cells, right? And on the outside is gonna be the stem cells. And as they go in, they mature become spermatids and eventually to sperm. Yeah, now I mentioned when we did hormones, we talked about um, FSH and LH. They came from the anterior pituitary. And I mentioned especially in uh, females, they're important. Follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, is going to cause uh, eggs to mature into follicles. And then LH peaked at ovulation. And I said in males, it has to do with sperm production. Well. It does. And just showing you that here um, is that FSH is going to be involved in sperm production, and LH making testosterone, which also helps make sperm production. So your brain has a feedback loop here. Uh, and you can look here. So here you're going to see FSH and LH, this is in a male, are produced. And so they're not going to any ovaries because the male doesn't have any. They're going to be traveling the blood to the testes. In the testes, you can see FSH is going to stimulate meiosis to make sperm, LH is gonna make you uh, make testosterone. And, and these things can come back, if you make a lot of it, they're gonna inhibit. So you make less of the FSH and LH, but it's gonna be this feedback loop. Yeah. And then of course, you know, these hormones are gonna stimulate uh, muscles and hair growth and your know, Adam's apple to grow and your voice to change and all these things to happen. So there's a peak 
there's a beginning of uh, hormones produced at puberty that will cause the testes to really ramp up making testosterone, making secondary sexual characteristics and beginning sperm production, which will continue throughout life. There's this negative feedback so that you have the right amounts of these hormones in your body. All right, so we're gonna see when we do female how different it is that females make all the eggs before they're born, they're all made. And, uh, and that's why older women worry more about birth defects because those eggs have been sitting around for decades. Uh, sperm are made daily, all the time. You always make any sperm. And they're made in these tubes, seminiferous tubules. And then all these tubes are gonna come together to make this thing called the reedy testes or all these tubes. And they're gonna go into this epididymis. that's kind of glommed on the side of the testes and they will mature in this epididymis, or hang out, ready to go if, if need be. Yes, and so sperm uh, can, can live there for weeks waiting. You know, they can live there, kind of suspended animation. <clears throat> and, but once they're uh, ejaculated, they can live inside the female for days too. So it makes you think about with birth control, you know, if a sperm can live five days and you try to have sex not around your, when you ovulate, you're like, oh, you better keep that in mind there so they can, they can hang out. But they generally don't live more than that. In other organisms, sperm can live for years inside the female tract, but in us, they don't last that long. Uh, but do know we, we freeze sperm too. You can freeze sperm in eggs and so, uh, in ultra cold freezing. Yep, and these sperm, they, uh, like I said, they're not swimming when they're in the testes at all. Um, usually when they're mixed with the semen, then they wake up and start swimming. Beautiful, big view of the testes microscopically. You got it? Can you see all those seminiferous tubules? Six to 900 meters of tubes. The reedy testes is gonna carry them all into this complicated little network into the epididymis, which is one long tube. And the sperm are gonna move down that uh, epididymis and they'll hang out at the end and see if they're needed. Here's a pre-puberty testy. So you can see the testes, in this case, there's no opening in the middle. See, that's not even hollow. So, <clears throat> um, we have cells that are making some testosterone, yes, but uh, the, uh, the cells that are gonna divide to make sperm don't wake up until uh, early teens when you hit puberty. Well, I talk about a lot of food in this class. I talk about eating thymus glands and eating uh, kidneys. You can eat testes too. Um, I've had turkey fries. I don't know, you deep fry anything, it's pretty good. Uh, I haven't had Rocky Mountain oysters, you know, uh, testes and uh, so not really, I don't feel a need to either. All right, so you guys have been listening patiently. We're headed towards the end here. We'll talk about uh, the epididymis. We'll get to some other glands, the penis, and then uh, we'll be good. So this epididymis is this tube that's about six meters long that's just glommed on the testes, all right? It's got a head, a body, a tail, and from the tail, the ductus deferens comes up behind the bladder to bring the sperm up. Uh, we'll take a look at it. We'll see it has big columnar cells and um, um, a muscle will move the sperm forward. They're not actually swimming. God, beautiful picture here. So one long tube is epididymis and that's where the sperm are making their way through. The final touches are put on, you know, and uh, uh, they're ready in the tail there, they will wait, they can wait in for weeks uh, and you always make new ones. If they're not used, they'll be reabsorbed by the body, but you're always making sperm. Yeah, so the cells, this is actually a pseudostratified, kind of, it's not, not as good as the, the nasal one. And it has these, uh, these long villi. And it, I don't even wanna tell you this, but it's called stereocilia, but it's not cilia, they're not moving, but they have these long, long processes and uh, the sperm in there, again, they, they, they think they're finishing touches there. All right, your vast deferens. As I said, it's a tube that you can actually feel on either side, a little tube, a solid tube. That's, uh, you'll see why, because it's just solid muscle, smooth muscle that's going to move the sperm up. 
And uh, when you're sexually excited, the muscle is going to really be contracting and move that sperm up, getting it ready uh, to be mixed with the other fluids to, to leave. I'm looking here, I can see this is this cremaster muscle that can raise the testes. There's this plexus of arteries and veins, countercurrent exchange even to keep it like two to three degrees cooler down at the testes. Yep. Ah, gorgeous. So just look how thick it is. That's all just smooth muscle. Ah, again, another beautiful view. All right, so what happens to these two uh, ductus deferens? They come up the testes, the spermatic cord, from the testes of the spermatic cord. Then they go around your pelvis to the back of the bladder. And that's what we're looking at here. They go to the back of the bladder and they come together. And this ampulla, the ampulla is where they, they kind of uh, balloon out a little bit. And then they're gonna meet these glands these glands here are called uh, seminif seminal vesicles. So a vesicle is like a, a bladder and a seminal is semen. So these are gonna be glands that make uh, the greatest percentage of fluid that's in semen are these two big glands that are stuck in the back of the bladder that meet the two ductus deferens that are carrying the sperm. And they're all gonna meet inside this big gland called the prostate gland. Prostate, you've all heard of that. And uh, if I were to look at the prostate gland from the side, you know, here's your bladder. You know, and this is the urethra. So it's going to carry the pee. There's going to be a sphincter here. That's the, and then meeting it is going to be a duct that comes back here. Here's the seminal vesicle. Here's going to be the vas deferens. And so we call this little duct the ejaculatory duct. Ejaculatory duct. And so they meet, ejaculatory duct meets the urethra. Here, there's a little valve. So either one fluid or the other is going to be going through that at a time. And uh, as I mentioned, males, the urethra does double duty, both reproduction and urine. And women, it just carries urine. All right. Let's see. We've got some more views here. Oh, so the fluid that comes out is semen and sperm make a tiny portion of that. So if you have a vasectomy, you make semen, you don't even notice there's less fluid because the sperms make up a small amount. It's mostly fluid produced by major, two major glands. The seminal vesicles make 60%, and then the prostate's gonna make 30%. And then you have a couple smaller glands here, these bulbourethral glands that make just mucus. Um, and so the sperm is going to be met with all this fluid and it's going to wake up the sperm. It's going to suspend it in this fluid, and this fluid can be put in the female. All right. Well, a way of birth control that is pretty damn good is vasectomy. All right. Um, so males can get a vasectomy, and this is an outpatient, easy procedure. Make a little slit, pull out a piece of the vas deferens, cut it, cauterize it, put on a band aid, you walk out. Seriously, it's really that easy. Um, and uh, they want to, uh, if you cauterize it and cut the ends, the sperm meet a dead end. Now there's a small chance that these ends can reconnect. That's why they cut out a piece and they cauterize the ends. But they used to just clamp it or something. That's, you know, if you don't think you're gonna have a baby, you, you shouldn't, you know, you, you want to be sure, all right? So, so now they take a piece. And so, um, and the deal with the vas vasectomy is that it's simple, it's easy, it's, um, but you gotta kind of treat it as irreversible, although you can get a, re a reversal. Um, as you can see, uh, a vasectomy can, Planned Parenthood can be really cheap, you know, depending where you go. And then the reversal is big money because you gotta go with microscopic anatomy and connect those ends again. And it's not always 100%. If scar tissue forms and so, you'll give a semen sample to see if it worked later on. And so, if you get a vasectomy, kind of plan on it, being permanent, you know. Um, yeah, it can be reversed, but it's it's not always happens. Yep. And so with the vasectomy, you make semen, there's just no sperm in it. And uh, you make all the hormones because the blood supply is still there. You make all the hormones, you just, you make the sperm, but it just has anywhere to go. Now, castration is something completely different. Castration is cutting off the balls, <laughs> the, the testes. And so if you cut off the testes, then you, um, you don't make any sperm. Oh, that's 100% effective. But you also don't make any testosterone. You make very little. Um, and so it has effects on your hormone levels. But a vasectomy just keeps sperm from being in the semen. So it's pretty good. 
and we'll see, you can see how, how, how common it is, 9% of US sexually active men. Um, the female version of it is tubal ligation and it's uh, more involved, it's a little more involved surgery. You gotta get in there and cut the tubes, the fallopian tubes and, and, and cauterize those too. All right, so let's get to these things. So um, here's these seminal vesicles. Again, they just make a whole bunch of fluid. And then here's the prostate gland is solid and round. All right, so the seminal vesicles here make 60% of the volume. And um, let's see if we talk about what's in it here. Yeah, so uh, if you look at it here, we don't need to do histology for everything, but it just makes lots of fluid, it makes lots and lots of fluid. And um, it's gonna make a, a kind of a whitish, yellowish, viscous uh, kind of fluid that mixes with it all. And then fructose is a sugar that's used as, um, as uh, energy for the sperm too. You also, I think it makes, it makes prostaglandins too. And, and that makes the vagina actually uh, contract and the cervix contract and um, helps um, foster fertilization. Because we'll see that sperm, once it's in the vagina, it's gotta get up into the uterus, you know, if it's gonna fertilize anything. Yep, so these, uh, these uh, seminal vesicles, they make 60% of the fluid and it's going to be uh, have sugars in it and it's going to have um, um, some enzymes and it's gonna have uh, some other things that are going to uh, mix with the uh, sperm. Another view, so making a lot of fluid. And the smooth muscle on the outside is what's gonna contract an ejaculation and push that fluid out to mix with the sperm. Cool artist renderings. So you can see these, here's the ureters that come down from the bladder, right? And so here you can see the, the vas deferens is gonna loop around the back. It's gonna widen as these ampulla and it's gonna go through the prostate as this ejaculatory duct. And uh, all these, this fluid from the seminal vesicles will mix with the sperm and a little bit of fluid coming up that way. Prostate's gonna put a bunch of fluid and it's gonna be on its, on, on its way out the urethra. Uh, bubble urethral glands are two little P-shaped glands that just make mucus. And so you can see they're, they're right here on either side. Uh, females have a homologous glands on either side of the opening of the vagina, have little mucus producing glands. But uh, yeah, these just produce uh, mucus. That's all. So that will, will add to it as well. And then the prostate gland. Now, just to be clear, the prostrate is laying like that. Prostate is a gland. And as you can see, if uh, you want to get it checked, if you're a male, they go through the rectum and you can push that prostate against the bladder and you can feel the shape and the bumpiness and the size of it like that. And yeah, we'll talk about prostate cancer. There it is. And so it's a solid gland. Some of the vesicles are, are hollow, making a lot of fluid. This is a solid gland. Um, yeah. And it has the urethra going through it. Yes, and so this makes the rest of the fluid besides the seminal vesicles. So various enzymes are gonna break down. So it's kind of makes the fluid watery. Oh, and importantly buffers too, because the vagina is acidic and uh, this will help buffer that acidity so the sperm are comfortable you know, swimming up there. Now you've probably heard of the prostate gland because Prostate cancer is a big killer of men. And then look at this, benign, benign hypertrophy means that it's not cancer and it means it's growing. So you're, you're, this is an enlarged prostate. And look at the stats here, half of the men over 50, 95% of the men over 70 have some you know, enlarged prostate. So it just happens, it just hypertrophy, it can turn cancers too, but here I'm just talking about the connective tissue just enlarges. And the issue is it makes urination difficult because that's where the urethra goes through. If that gets big enough, it makes you have to pee a lot because uh, you can't empty your bladder completely and you have to use more force. It can, pressure can build up to your kidneys, things like that. So um, yeah. Let's look at cancer here. Yeah, this is men only looking at that. So um, skin cancer is not on here, but you can see prostate is up there along with lung cancer and colon cancer. Up there is number one. 
So um, <clears throat> prostate cancer, very common and uh, one in 20 men, that's amazing. And, but in many cases, it's not uh, like lung cancer is definitely uh, will kill you more than prostate cancer uh, statistically. Um, so uh, yeah, you guys get that. And so um, as you get older, um, you may get prostate cancer, but you may it may grow so slowly that you'll die of something else, you know, and so you die with your prostate cancer. So that's what I'm kind of saying. It can be slow growing, uh, but you can see it's very common. Um, it's difficult to, to um, do surgery in the prostate too. It's, it's in there. And if you, there's important nerves and uh, your urethra goes through it. So I, I'm not a surgeon, but I can imagine this would be really delicate to try to get into. Um, and you can see here, here's a stage four, you know, a bad case. I mean, Stage one, you know, you just notice um, um, a tumor and you might not even notice it, uh, but stage four is when it's spreading, of course. So that's the real danger is metastasis of this uh, prostate cancer elsewhere. Um, yeah, and so they will do prostate exams. They don't do it routinely on men when they get older, unless there's some family history or you have some urination problems. Uh, but, you, you know, it's just finger in the anus and, the, and they'll see what they can feel there. And actually nowadays uh, they, they do just a blood test, this uh, PSA. Um, you have uh, certain chemicals in your blood when you have uh, uh, prostate cancer. So a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, in Iceland, there's a, muse a penis museum. And of course, being an anatomist, you know, we had to go. It's a blue whale right there. Um, the penis, well, the human penis does not have a bone in it. You're probably saying to yourself, you know, this is, this is college anatomy, Parmelino. You know. But <clears throat> when you look at uh, a lot of mammals have a bone in the penis. Uh, this is one from a walrus. The Eskimos call it an usix. It's called a baculum. I have a small collection of baculum of penis bones, but you'll see even minks, coyotes, raccoons, bears. Um, there's a lot of primates besides humans, uh, rodents, insectivores. Um, uh, um, cetaceans or whales, and uh, um, so, and then uh, and then uh, some carnivores too. So I remember learning in comparative anatomy, prick. You know, I got there's a way to remember memorize who has you know penis bones, but we don't have penis bones. Um, it's just going to be um, erectile tissue that when you fill it up with blood, it's going to make it solid. But a bear has a bone in there. You know, it keeps it like that. All right. So um, I'll explain how it all happens. But basically, you look at a penis there, and it's got really these three cylinders of erectile tissue. When I throw that around. It's, it looks like a like a Nerf football cut in half or a sponge, kind of dark red because it's very bloody. But you've got this uh, um, this erectile tissue. It looks the same in the male and female when you look at it. Female is just smaller. But I'll explain how it works exactly. But anatomically, we have um, two big corpora cavernosum. Corpora means like a corpse or corpus Christi, means a body. So two big uh, cavernous bodies on top and then a corpora spongiosum in the bottom. And they go to the end of the penis. This is the, the glands. The glands is the head of the penis right there. And then as you go back in the body, I'm gonna go ahead and draw it. Let's see, so that corpus spongiosum, it turns into this bulb. And the top two, ooh. Oh, jeez. Okay, I'll just draw it in red. The top two go like this, they go. Yeah, these are stuck on your pelvis on the inside. You have these two legs, these two cross these legs and then you have a bulb in the middle. That's like the root of the penis stuck on your pelvis and they come up to make the penis, the body and then the glands, they come out like that. And that spongiosum will hold the urethra and then make the whole head of it, the whole glands at the top at the end. Yeah, and then um, uh, prepice is another word for foreskin. And uh, if this was, this is a circumcised, circumcision is a uh, um, uh, surgery done in different cultures. Um, when, uh, hopefully when you're a baby, it's more painful when you're an adult, when they remove the, uh, the foreskin surgically. And so you don't, you don't have it. Uh, the whole discussion there, I've gotten into Fights. Some people think it's mutilating this child that doesn't have a choice, et cetera. I don't feel that way. Um, so there's, there's like there's a, there's a whole big um, 
you know, circumcision, good or bad, I kind of thing going out there that I don't want to get into at all with you guys. All right. So um, anyway, the um, uh, the preface would be the foreskin that would cover it, would cover the glands and uncircumcised uh, men, but it can be cut off and then you're circumcised. Got it. All right. So this erectile tissue, so this is how it works pretty much, is that you've got blood vessels in this erectile tissue. And the erectile tissue can fill up with blood or be empty with blood. And what happens is that space in there, when it's empty with blood, you have these arteries, they're called helicine arteries, because they're kind of like a helix. They're kind of, yeah, it's like a double helix. They're kind of twisted like this. And when they straighten out and relax, and that cavity, re the muscle relaxes, the blood pours in there, it gets larger. And then the key is when that cavernous space is enlarged, they press on the veins that drain it and they keep it turgid or solid like that. So you can see the veins are big, and when it's uh, erect, the veins are squished. So the blood is just leaking out slowly, and it keeps that erection like that. Yeah, let's see. Now here's kind of um, diagrammatic, so you can see. So here, when the penis is just flaccid like this, you've got our blood coming in, here's the spaces, blood leaving, la la la. And then if the muscle relaxes and allows more blood to come in, uh, and then this enlarges, letting more blood come in, that's gonna fill up so much, it's gonna squeeze the outflow of the blood. And so, voila, that's what causes uh, erectile tissue to be erect in both men and women. So big histological view of the penis. Here's the corporate spongiosum, this is the urethra, and here's the corporate cavernosum. And these spaces will be filled with blood. All right. Yep, just a couple more views. I'm taking a look. I think we are done. Um, yeah, it's a long one. Yeah, so the testes, you're know, going to make the the the, the uh, testosterone, and they're also going to make the sperm. The sperm are going to go in the epididymis where they mature, and they're carried up the ductus deferens to the back of the bladder on either side, where they're going to meet up with these seminal vesicles that make 60% of the fluid through this ejaculatory duct, where they're going to meet the urethra through the prostate, which is going to add. 30% more of the fluid, then it comes out the urethra, out the penis, like that. Yep. And this shows a preface or foreskin uh, covering the glands. And the penis, you know, has thin skin, lots of nerves, no hair. So, you know, you guys are familiar with that. And then here's your bubble urethral glands. They're just like putting mucus. So put that in, lubricating mucus will come out of those like that. Here's a view looking this way. Same thing. All right, this is what be useful to study, different parts of the male reproductive organs. Okay. All right, reproductive lecture, there you go. Um, a lot of big picture stuff in the beginning, just get you, get you, you know, into this system that is uh, unusual among all the systems that we can live without it. But uh, we went through, uh, yeah, reproduction, why sex, and then uh, get into the male, looked at uh, anatomically, and then what's going on all the way from the, the testes to the, the outside of the penis. And uh, the next lecture we'll do, uh, we'll look at female, and we'll look at uh, um, a little more fertilization, and we'll get into some other things I can add on here. But uh, obviously an interesting topic, you know, sex, you know, sex, drugs, music, things like that tend to, 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 to sell videos, but <laughs> this is my class video. So I'm really not trying to be scandalous at all. So, all right, you guys, hope you uh, enjoy the video. Hope you, when you read the chapter, don't get caught up too much in meiosis, things like that. I mean, I assume you know that. So I'm gonna just jump right to what I talked about in this lecture, basic anatomy, function, what happens here, there, et cetera. All right.